So, toward the end of the Roman Empire in 306, Constantine takes the throne and legalizes Christianity. Then, after him, Theodosius comes to power and not only makes Christianity the official religion of the empire, but also decrees that upon his death, the empire be divided into the Eastern and Western empires. So we have almost 200 years from when Constantine legalizes Christianity until the end of the Western Roman Empire by the year 476. This timing is pretty significant because it allows Christianity to really spread and take hold throughout Europe. The bulk of the Roman Empire was in Europe, so Christianity was spreading throughout the European continent. Even as the Germanic migrations are happening, they are encountering this now Christian civilization, and many experience conversion to the Christian faith. So by the time you have the end of the Western Roman Empire, a vast majority of people in Europe are Christian. Had Constantine and Theodosius ruled even a hundred years later, there might not have been sufficient time for Christianity to spread so prolifically. Remember that Rome controlled virtually all of Western Europe, most of Central Europe, and all the way north to Britain. And while the Roman Empire was declining, there were all these Germanic tribes coming in from northeastern Europe and Western Asia. So what ended up happening was that when Rome fell, the provinces outside of the Italian peninsula, especially Central Europe up through Britain, went from being ruled by Roman governors to having no central power over them at all. So there was really this void of power in Europe after the fall of Rome. Now all these former Roman provinces had nothing to connect them, so they fell back into these small isolated blocks, and call them kingdoms if you will, where the wealthiest families or nobles are in charge. The nobles own these large lots of land and farms and they let people rent the land to live on. The people who rent the land pay their rent by farming and providing food to the landowner or some other necessary good or service. Some even pay a monetary tax, though this was far less common. But here is where things get sticky. The Roman Empire did a good job of keeping the citizens in its provinces safe, but once it was gone, they had zero defense. A random farmer and his family had absolutely nothing to protect them from some wandering barbarian tribe looking to plunder. So there's this time of uncertainty and terror. And what ends up happening is this pretty idealized social contract. These farmers and other poor lower class people, they go to the nobles and say, hey, you have enough money to get us some protection. What if I work for you and give you my food and other things in exchange for your protection? The nobles say, sure, that sounds good. So now there's this system across large parts of Europe where this sort of mini society, it's called a microcosm, exists. So there's this noble, or king if he called himself that, but his reign didn't stretch very far, who owns this large amount of land and all the people who live in his vicinity pay rent to live on his land and work for him in exchange for his protection. This system is called feudalism. There were different social classes in this system. The key idea though is that people were tied to the land and the lord of the manor, which is another word for a large house with lots of land around it. Some manors were tiny little castles. Some were monasteries, as during this time as Christianity spread, the religious orders increased and the building of monasteries supported this growth. The lowest class of people were still slaves, but during this time, slaves weren't super popular because the Lord didn't have much to work with. Since there was no one traveling to places that once provided slaves, and no one was conquering new lands to turn prisoners into slaves, there really wasn't a large availability of slaves. The problem was that these large farms took a lot of manpower to run. And, of course, the owners didn't want to abandon their land and lose their wealth, so they were happy to promise protection in exchange for renting out their land. And the owners realized that they would be in a pretty bad place if people started leaving to go elsewhere. But, instead of making their little kingdom an awesome place to be so people wanted to stay, they made it a really harsh place and forced their workers into so much debt that they couldn't leave. So you have this whole class of people who literally had nothing to offer except their labor, and a lord who promises them protection in exchange for labor. But you don't own the land you work on, so you can't leave unless the lord lets you. Well, guess what? They don't let you. They're not going to lose essentially free labor. So you have these free people who aren't really free. They aren't slaves, they can't be bought or sold, and they're not considered property. But they're tied to the land. These unfree workers are called serfs. So from the end of the Western Roman Empire in 476, these little serfdoms employ the feudal system. It's a pretty terrible way to live and there is virtually zero innovation or spread of ideas. The vast majority of people, even the nobles, are illiterate. 
In fact, and this is why the spread of Christianity was so vital, the only people who are reliably educated enough to read and write are the monks who hand copy the Bible. If Christianity had never been legalized and given enough time to spread throughout Europe, it's possible that most of Europe would have completely lost the writing system and records that go along with it. So anyway, you have this time that is just not really all that great for anyone. It used to be called the Dark Ages because there was just nothing exciting going on in terms of cultural achievement. But then, during the 9th century, a little more than 300 years after the fall of Rome, this guy comes to power named Charlemagne. He gets this great idea to start working with a bunch of nobles and consolidate some land and power. He does a pretty good job and has this sort of mini empire in the works. This is great for the serfs because now Charlemagne gives everyone a little bit of protection. So there isn't this dire need for the lord who owns your land to keep you safe. But then he dies and it sort of breaks apart again. But Charlemagne's footprint didn't disappear. There were two reasons for this. First, he gave a lot of the land he conquered to the church, so once he was gone, the people living on that land were now beholden to the church. The Christian church, again, had an enormous advantage because A, they were literate, B, they owned a lot of land, and C, people, especially rich ones like Charlemagne, would gift the monasteries and churches land and very expensive items, so the church had a lot of wealth. Second, Charlemagne was a tough defender of Christianity. As he conquered Germanic tribes, he forced them to either convert to Christianity or die. At his death, his empire covered most of Western Europe, and so he was basically responsible for the survival of Christianity throughout Europe. His effect was so profound that many refer to Charlemagne as the father of Europe. So during Charlemagne's rule, the church is pretty happy because he's consolidating land and making things safer for everyone, including the religious people like monks who live in monasteries, and the Pope, the leader of the church, is so happy he dubs Charlemagne the new Roman Emperor. This sticks around even after Charlemagne is gone. His lands grow into what is known as the Holy Roman Empire. It wasn't so much Roman as it was holy. The use of Roman was really more to make people think about the power of the real Roman Empire and help legitimize this new era of rule. But, while all this is going on in Central and Northern Europe, something pretty major was happening over in North Africa and Asia Minor. In the 600s, the Prophet Muhammad founded the Islamic religion. This religion becomes the basis for a new empire. The Islamic empire does an awesome job of inventing things, keeping records, and basically everything the poor little serfdoms aren't doing in medieval Europe. One of the really important places in the Islamic empire is right in the same area as the most important place for Christians. Well, this becomes a major issue with the church. They are not happy about this new empire that is not only interested in expanding their borders, but is also sitting right in the middle of the Christian holy land. So by the end of the 11th century, around 1095, the church decides to attack this perceived problem. And by attack, I mean actually attack. They start paying people to serve as soldiers to travel to the Holy Land, which is Jerusalem and the region around it, and fight the people there so the Christians can gain control again. These wars are called the Crusades, and they go off and on for several hundred years. And, okay, at the same time, you have other stuff going on in Europe. The church is really the unifying force at this point because there's so many little kingdoms scattered around. But eventually, these smaller nobles decide they want to control more land and people so that they can become wealthier. So they start to fight each other. And the small domains start to grow into larger ones. And suddenly you have these very large regions controlled by kings. This is where the beginning of the countries we have now occurs. England, France, Spain. These regions are unified under a single ruler. And unfortunately, some of those rulers aren't the nicest, because really those new large kingdoms grew out of the feudal system, so the kings are really living off of the labor and money of the people in their domain. And the king can really do whatever he wants, he's essentially above the law. And then you have this idea of divine rule, which basically means the king got his power to be king from God. And the church really supports this because they get a lot of wealth from these kings, and in return they have a lot of influence and power regarding laws and such. <laughs> 
So anyway, you have these rulers who demand ridiculous taxes, work, etc., and their people start to get really tired of this. In England, specifically, by the 13th century, which is the 1200s, they get so fed up there is a civil war, and the king realizes that if he wants to have any power, he has to give the people something in return. Well, remember back when the Romans came up with this idea of the rule of law, which says no one is above the law and you have everyone subject to the same laws and same punishments? Well, the people are like, yeah, this is what we want. We want to make sure we have some rights and the king has to follow the laws too and be fair. So in 1215, we have this monumental occurrence, really the biggest thing in politics since the 12 tables from Rome. The nobles in England draft a document called the Magna Carta, which means Great Charter. It is pretty widely regarded as the first sort of constitution in Europe. It isn't perfect, and it goes through a couple of revisions, but even today, it's celebrated as a sort of Independence Day, because it really is when the people of England are freed from the unjust rule of kings. And this Magna Carta, it isn't just important for the people of England at the time. It's important for people hundreds of years later because as European powers start to expand to the New World, the British colonists start to feel kind of the same way as the people in the 1200s. They're like, hey, back then people put together this document that limited the power of the king and made things fairer for the common people. Let's do that. And that's really how the idea of our constitution came into effect. The founders really used the Magna Carta as a starting point for writing the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. But even before the founders used the Magna Carta as the blueprint for our country's important documents, others were influenced by it as well. Later in England, in the early 1600s, kings were gaining too much power. So the nobles drafted the English Bill of Rights to ensure that the king wouldn't have absolute power, which, by the way, was what had happened in France and was causing all sorts of trouble. And this really ended the major power of the monarchy in England and put Parliament in charge of the government. Not only in England, but in the New World settlements, the influence of the Magna Carta could be seen too. One group of people who were supposed to be sailing to the colony of Virginia ended up lost and landed at Plymouth in modern-day Massachusetts. They realized that they weren't under the ruling boundaries of the English king, so instead of finding their way to Virginia or sending back word that they'd ended up in Plymouth, they decided they'd rather rule themselves and drafted the Mayflower Compact, which was its own little constitution of sorts. And so all of this was how governments really progressed from the fall of Rome to when America would declare its independence and form a new sort of hybrid government no one had ever seen before. Rome fell and created a power void. Landowning nobles became lords and kings and developed the feudal system. The church grew in power, Charlemagne came to power and started to bring things back together, nobles started to fight each other and territories began to consolidate into larger and larger kingdoms, the church funded the crusades, people in these now rather large kingdoms like England banded together and demanded rights and rule of law, the Magna Carta was written, exploration began, the colonies were founded, independence from England is declared, and the Revolutionary War starts. And there you have about 1,200 years of European history smashed into about 13 minutes. Ta-da!